to Matthew uh, 16. I'll begin reading at uh, verse 13 and read through to the end of the chapter to verse 28. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias or Elijah, and others Jeremiah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged to his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offence unto me, for thou savourest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And we leave God's word there and we come back for the sermon this morning to those verses 21 through 23. Matthew 16, 21 through 23. From that time forth, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offence unto me. For thou savourest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. That the ministry and work of Jesus Christ would ultimately end in his death was implicit in the things that he did and taught from the very outset of his public ministry. However, the fact that he would actually die and have to die in order to accomplish uh, his work was not explicitly stated by Jesus until after Peter's public confession that acknowledged him to be the Christ. And that occurred at Caesarea Philippi. 
And there, Peter and the other disciples, through the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit, came to the realisation that Jesus was not just a great healer, nor was he, in fact, one of the prophets restored to life again, as some had surmised. He was not John the Baptist restored to life. He was not Elijah, nor was he Jeremiah. He was, in fact, none other than the long-awaited Messiah, the Christ, uh, the anointed of God, the one whom God had promised would come and be the deliverer and saviour of his people, the one who would be furnished with all authority and power to execute fully the uh, plan of God for the salvation of his people. Peter and the other disciples, having been brought to the realisation that Jesus was the Christ, uh, the time now had come where Jesus would enlighten his disciples as to those things that would actually shortly before him. And what he had to say, they would find difficult to receive. Indeed, it would conflict with everything that they'd ever been taught concerning the Messiah. And so here we find that Jesus, for the first time, uh, directs the attention of his disciples explicitly uh, to the prospect of his death and dying and of the cross. We read, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Uh, what that revealed was that the kingdom that Jesus Christ had come to establish was not an earthly kingdom. There would be no earthly kingdom, no earthly uh, glory. Uh, but the kingdom that Jesus Christ had come to, to establish would involve, in fact, rejection, suffering, shame, and ultimately death. And the revelation of those things okay, occasioned confusion and consternation among the disciples. Indeed, in response to Jesus' revelation of those things, uh, Peter actually rebukes Jesus, saying to him, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. The response of Jesus to those words of Peter was withering. We find that Jesus turns and says to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offence unto me. For thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. And that's what we're going to consider this morning, brethren, the, uh, really the response of Jesus Christ uh, to Peter. We'll be looking at uh, the nature of the response and the purpose of the response and the reason for the response. So the theme of the sermon this morning is this, Get thee behind me, Satan. Part of the sermon under these uh, three headings, a stinging uh, rebuke, secondly, an appropriate response, and then finally, a tender resolve. Get thee behind me, Satan. Uh, Jesus spoke those words before all of his disciples. Those words, of course, were addressed specifically uh, to Peter. And no matter how some may wish to lessen the forcefulness of those words, there is no escaping the fact that what Jesus said to Peter amounted to an extremely sharp rebuke. In fact, one might describe it as a stinging rebuke. Arguably, these are the sharpest words that Jesus ever uttered in the course of his earthly ministry. And he spoke them to Peter. Peter, who it should be noted, had just declared that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter, to whom Jesus had also said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed these things unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven.' 
Peter, to whom Jesus had also said, Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It was also to Peter that Jesus says, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offence unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Roman Catholicism uh, seeks to play down the sharpness and the significance of this rebuke. Uh, Roman Catholicism does that in an attempt to preserve unsullied their assertion that Peter was the first pope. Church of Rome grounds that erroneous contention in Jesus' words that thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. According to Roman Catholicism, by those words, Jesus was appointing Peter as the first pope of the Christian church. However, Rome's contention would be significantly weakened if Jesus' words to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, are viewed as a stinging rebuke. So therefore, Roman Catholicism seeks to play down the sharpness and the implications of the rebuke. But there is no legitimate grounds for doing so. But then this was a stinging rebuke. And it should be noted that this rebuke was ministered by Jesus to Peter and that it actually arose out of a rebuke that Peter, in his wisdom, or lack thereof, uh, administered uh, to Jesus. We read there in verse 22, Then Peter took him, that is Jesus, and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. The background to the exchange between Jesus and Peter is significant. As we've already noted, these events took place at Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi was in the northern part of Galilee. Matthew 16 finds Jesus and his disciples coming to the end of their third and final circuit of Galilee. Uh, the cross was only some six months away. It was there in Caesarea Philippi that Jesus put to his disciples the question, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And his disciples responded by relaying uh, to Jesus the commonly held conceptions among the people. They told him that some said that he was John the Baptist, others thought that he was in fact, Elijah, others thought that he was Jeremiah, risen, all of these risen from the dead. But that was not really the question that Jesus was actually interested in, what others thought. What he wanted to know was what the disciples thought. And so he presses them, but whom say ye that I am? And in response, Simon Peter, speaking on behalf of, of all of the disciples declares that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now that was a truly profound confession. Peter rightly identified Jesus as the Christ, the anointed of God, the promised Messiah. And this confession, as Jesus reveals, had not come about by virtue of the disciples' uh, ingenuity or wisdom, but it had been divinely revealed to them. God the Father had in fact revealed the true identity of Jesus to Peter and to the other disciples. But that did not mean that Peter and the other disciples understood all things concerning Jesus Christ and the work that he'd come to perform. Though they confidently asserted that Jesus was the Christ, their conception of him as the Christ or the Messiah was limited and in some respects erroneous. Peter and the other disciples, you see, had very little comprehension of the true nature of the work of Jesus Christ. The disciples were a product of their age. They had imbibed many of the widely held, though erroneous, conceptions of the Messiah. The understanding of the vast majority in Israel in that day uh, was 
uh, confused at best as regards the Messiah. The majority of people anticipated and looked for a Messiah who would deliver them from the oppression of the Romans, a Messiah who would establish a glorious earthly kingdom uh, centred in Jerusalem. The common conception of the Messiah was in that day was in fact of an earthly a carnal king. And even the disciples had very little understanding that the kingdom that Jesus had come to establish was in fact not an earthly kingdom but a spiritual kingdom. And despite all that, uh, uh, they furthermore did not uh, fully appreciate that Jesus in fact had come into the world not to deliver men from the uh, bondage of the Romans but in fact to deliver them from the uh, bondage and curse of sin, from the guilt and the punishment and the power of sin. He came into the world to reconcile men and women uh, to God. He came to bring spiritual healing. This was the nature of the deliverance that Jesus had come into the world to provide. In fact, really had never entered into uh, the thinking of the disciples. It's not what they've been taught uh, to expect of the Messiah. So consequently, they, like most of the compatriots, look for an earthly king, an earthly deliverer. This is what their fathers had expected, and those same expectations had filtered down uh, to the current generation. In light of the prevailing misconception among the Jews, including the disciples regarding the Messiah, Jesus begins to enlighten his disciples with respect to to those things that would shortly befall him. That's verse 21. From that time uh, forth, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how they must go unto Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised the third day. And it says from that time forth there, uh, that is from the time of the confession of the disciples, that Jesus was the Christ. From that time forth, Jesus began to reveal to his disciples those things that would actually befall him in Jerusalem. You see, up to this point in time, Jesus had not explicitly broached those matters. He alluded to those things, but he had never expressly spoken about those things that he would actually suffer at the hands of men. Prior to this time, Jesus had spoken, in fact, really in veiled terms about his impending suffering and death. For example, you read in Mark chapter 2 and verse 20, But the days will come, said Jesus, when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. He spoke about the bridegroom but gave no explanation as to who, in fact, was the bridegroom and how that bridegroom, in fact, would be taken Away. Furthermore, uh, for example, in Matthew 12 and verses 39 and 40, you read this, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Uh, but still again, no explanation as to what Uh, he was actually referring to there when he spoke about uh, the Son of Man being three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. But now, after the revelation to the disciples that he is the Christ, Jesus speaks openly and plainly, and he speaks openly and plainly concerning his suffering, his death, and his resurrection, so plainly that the disciples could not help but understand what he was actually saying to them. You see, the cross was on the horizon. The disciples needed to be prepared for that impending eventuality. They knew Jesus to be the Christ, and now they needed to know what that would mean for him and for them. What specifically was it that Jesus began to show his disciples? Well, Jesus directed the attention of his disciples to his impending suffering, death, and resurrection. He told them furthermore that he must go to Jerusalem. He told them that he must suffer. He told them that he must be killed. And finally, uh, 
he must be raised again the third day. But what he said, that Jesus made plain to his disciples, that these things were not simply mere possibilities, but they are actually according to the divine appointment of God. All these things were necessary. They must come to pass. The must here was the must of divine necessity. It was the will of God that the Son of Man should go to Jerusalem, that he should suffer many things of the uh, elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and that he be killed and that he be raised again on the third day. The way in which Jesus, or rather the way in which God purposed to save those whom he had uh, committed to the care of Jesus Christ was in fact through the way of suffering, of death, and ultimately the resurrection of his son. Now you can appreciate from the perspective of the disciples that when they would not really heard of these things before, that when Jesus reveals these things to them, uh, it's somewhat startling from their perspective. In stark contrast to their expectations, Jesus here warns them that the way ahead of him and the way ahead of them would be one of great personal suffering and sacrifice. It'd be the way of hurt, the way of pain, of sorrow, of sadness. It'd be the way, furthermore, of rejection. That's brought out particularly in uh, Mark 8.31, which is the parallel passage to this uh, passage in Mark 16. There in that uh, passage in Mark uh, chapter 8, uh, we're told that Jesus uh, told his disciples he would be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes. But not only must he suffer, not only must he be rejected, but perhaps the thing that would have uh, been taken notice most of by the disciples was that he must be killed. He must die. In all likelihood, that is probably the thing that the disciples would have particularly remembered from those things that Jesus told them. He must die. He had told them that he would also rise again after three days, but that probably failed to register in the minds of the disciples in the light of the revelation that Jesus was to die. Jesus' revelation of his impending suffering, rejection, death, uh, and the talk of his subsequent rising from the dead in many respects, were too much for the disciples. The thought of such things were completely foreign to them. The prospect of those things, in fact, had never entered their minds. They understood what Jesus had said, but what he had said came as a shock to them. They never contemplated that those things might come the way of Jesus Christ. Certainly these things were too much for Peter. We read in verse 22, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Suffering, rejection and death had no place in Peter's conception of the Messiah. To hear Jesus even speak in such terms was distressing to him. We're told that Peter took him. And the Greek word translated took him means literally to call to the side of. And so hearing these things, the indication here is that Peter called Jesus to his side. Uh, I think you can uh, view the scenario as something akin to the situation where uh, perhaps uh, a child has been misbehaving during the course of a class. And at the end of the class and all the other students are exiting the room uh, the teacher calls that particular student uh, to their side and uh, then reveals to them or speaks to them about uh, their conduct. And it's uh, something similar to that that takes place here so far as Jesus is concerned in his uh, intercourse with uh, Peter. Manifesting his characteristic impetuosity, Peter, having called Jesus to his side, proceeds to rebuke him that is to chide him. 
for teaching what to Peter seemed not only inconceivable, but just plainly wrong. It made no sense to Peter that Jesus should speak of his suffering and death, that these things should happen to the Messiah was out of the question so far as Peter was concerned. Out of his affection for Jesus, and I think we ought not to mistake that, this was out of affection for Jesus, but out of his affection for Jesus, coupled though one would say also with his ignorance, Peter chided Jesus and told him effectively not to speak in such terms. In doing so, uh, Peter severely overreached himself and he forgot to whom he was speaking. And the truth was, of course, that Peter himself was actually ignorant, ignorant of the plan of God for the salvation of God's people. So Peter blurts out, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Those words could also be perhaps translated in a slightly different way. God be merciful to thee. This shall not be unto thee. Or could also be translated, Lord, be propitious. That is, Lord, be benevolent to thyself. Not at all. Never, never shall this be unto you. Whatever the precise uh, meaning of those words, what's plain is that Peter intended to convey to Jesus a sense of his aversion and abhorrence at what he had said. He was saying to Jesus, in effect, this must never be. Uh, This is foolishness. This is not necessary. Peter, who had so recently confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, should in fact have known better. He should have known better in the first place than to chide Jesus Christ. He should also have known better uh, to have asserted that those things were not necessary. Had he never read Isaiah 53, He is despised and rejected of men. Speaking here, of course, of Christ, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him stricken. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. Peter's rebuke, though well-intentioned, carried with it profound implications. You see, Peter was blind to the necessity of the cross What in effect Peter was actually saying to Jesus is that there is no need, there is no need of the cross. You don't need to go this way. There is no need for you to die. You see, Peter at this point in time still entertained an expectation of an earthly kingdom and the suffering and death of Jesus did not fit with such thinking. He lacked an appreciation of the purpose and the significance of Jesus Christ's suffering, death and subsequent resurrection. Just think of it, brethren. What what if Jesus had actually acceded to the advice of Peter? Cross is not necessary. Don't go that way, Lord. What if Jesus had said, yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, We won't go to Jerusalem. We won't go to the way of suffering and of death. But brethren, that could never be. That could never be. From the day of his birth, the whole life of Jesus Christ had been directed to the cross. He came into the world for the purpose that he actually might die upon the cross of Calvary for the salvation of 
of his people. That was clear to Jesus Christ from the very beginning of his life all the way through to the end. And now that day, that day was clearly in sight for him. And so therefore we read in verse 23, But Jesus turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offence unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Peter began to rebuke Jesus. But the indication here is that Peter was not permitted to finish what he intended to say because Jesus interrupted him. The moment that Peter began to question the necessity of the way of suffering, death and the resurrection, Jesus cut him off. He did not entertain the thinking of Peter for a moment. We're told there in verse 23, but he turned and said unto Peter. What that involved is made plain or made plainer for us in the parallel account in Mark 8 where we read this. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter. It appears that Peter and the other disciples were initially behind Jesus and then Peter had come to Jesus' side in order to speak with him. But when Peter began to rebuke Jesus, Jesus actually turned his back on Peter, a, a, a dismissive gesture. Jesus turns his back on Peter and then faces the other disciples and says to them, speaking to Peter but directing his words to the other disciples, get the behind me, Satan. What Peter was attempting to do and what Peter was saying was so significant that Jesus turned his back on him and rebuked him in a very public and open way. Why did he do that? What Peter had said amounted to essentially the same thing that Satan had sought to do to Jesus a few years earlier in the wilderness of Judea, right at the very outset of his earthly ministry. We read that this morning in Luke 4. You recall that there at the very outset of Jesus' earthly ministry, uh, for a period of some 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus was tempted by Satan. And we read of one of those temptations in Luke 4, 5 through 7. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed him unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee in the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore will worship, will worship me, all shall be thine. Now that was a real temptation. What was the significance of that temptation? Satan was offering to Jesus Christ uh, the reward that had been promised to him by God the Father for the fulfilment of the salvation of God's people. And Satan was offering that same reward to him, but not by way of the cross. The purpose of Satan's temptation there in the wilderness was in fact to turn Jesus Christ away from the cross. Satan was saying to Jesus, you can have it all. You can have all the things of this world. You can have all of the power and the glory of this world and you can have it without the necessity of the cross. It's not necessary, said Satan to Jesus, to endure the suffering and the shame and the death. You can have it all without those things. 
You can have everything the world has to offer. All you have to do is bow down and worship me to give me the honour and the glory that rightly belongs to God himself. And so Satan's goal in that temptation was actually to dissuade Jesus from the way of the cross. And if he could have persuaded Jesus to do uh, or to have those things apart from the way of the cross, of course Satan would have actually accomplished his purposes. Uh, He would have actually, in fact, attained the victory that he was seeking. Uh, He would have, in fact, uh, turned Jesus from the cross and the result would have been that the people of God would not have been saved. Note Jesus' response to Satan's temptation there in the wilderness. Luke 4, 8, he says to him, Get thee behind me, Satan. The cross, you see, was the very reason that Jesus Christ had come into the world. And the whole of his life, as I said earlier, was directed to the cross. It was only in the way of suffering and of death, it was only in the way, in the way of the cross that the people of God might be saved. Put it more personally, it was only through the cross and the way of the cross that any of us here might ever be saved. In the words of Peter spoken at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus heard that same proposition of Satan being urged upon him again. Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Avoid the cross, the cross is not necessary. There is no need for you to suffer and die. This coming from the mouth of one now of his disciples Peter, though no doubt well intentioned, was being, you see, used as a tool in Satan's hands in a further attempt to divert Jesus from the cross. But Jesus would not have it. He would not have it. He had no intention whatsoever of avoiding the cross. He came into the world to save the people of God. And there will be no turning away from the suffering and death of the cross. You see that resolve that's evidenced here, uh, evidenced time and again in the events that led up to Calvary. One only needs to turn one's mind to the events that took place the very night before Jesus' crucifixion in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember how there in the Garden of Gethsemane he said to his heavenly Father, Father, if thou be willing to remove this cup from me, nevertheless not my will, but thine be done. There's also there in the Garden of Gethsemane that we read in John 18, 4 and 5, Jesus therefore knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth, and this is when the band of 500 come seeking him to arrest him. We are told that Jesus went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. What did Jesus say? He said, I am he. And then in that same event, you have that 500 strong band falling backwards to the ground as he declares that I am he. Uh, But then as they recover themselves, uh, Jesus again asks them, whom seek ye? And again they say, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus says, "Let let us be going. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Jesus here applies the very phrase that he employed when addressing Satan there in the wilderness, and he applies it now to Peter. And Jesus certainly here is addressing Satan, but at the same time he is also speaking to Peter. Jesus was not suggesting that Peter was Satan, 
but he was implying that Peter was serving the interests of Satan in urging him to avoid the suffering and death of the cross. And so Jesus says, Thou art an offence unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. An offence there refers to literally a stumbling block. Satan was seeking again to stumble Jesus Christ to dissuade him from fulfilling, fulfilling the purpose and the plan of God. And he says, For thou savest, will you strive after, will you set your mind not on the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. You see, Satan had no interest, of course, in the plan of God. His only interest in the plan of God was to thwart the plan of God. But the will of God was that Jesus Christ uh, should go to the cross. And he did. He did. And that's really what we should take uh, from this message this morning as we come to the Lord's Supper. Why did Jesus Christ uh, go to the cross? It's true he went to the cross as the obedient uh, servant of Jehovah. But he also went to the cross out of love. Jesus Christ went to the cross out of love for his people and the desire for their salvation. And if we put that in personal terms, he went to the cross for you and for me and out of a desire for our salvation. And that's what we see uh, set before us also this morning again in the Lord's Supper. What we see here is the resolve of Jesus Christ, the determination of Jesus Christ. There was never a time when he contemplated, as it were, following the advice of Peter. Nothing could divert him from the cross. These things, the suffering, the rejection, the, the death, the resurrection... All of those things were according to the will of God. All of those things were necessary, absolutely necessary. It was necessary that he go to Jerusalem, that he suffer many things of the chief priests and the, and the scribes. It was necessary that he be killed. It was necessary, absolutely necessary, that he rise again the third day. And so out of love for those whom God had chosen in him, he laid down his life. And that's what we see depicted for us in the Lord's Supper this morning. How mistaken Peter had been. Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. There's something ironic about that, isn't there? because Peter's own salvation actually depended on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And yet here he is urging Jesus not to go that way. But go that way he did. In obedience to the will of God and out of love for his people, Jesus willingly sacrificed himself upon Calvary's tree. How thankful how thankful should we be? What's uh, interesting and perhaps even encouraging is that eventually Peter himself came to appreciate the necessity of the cross. On the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, verses 22 and 23, uh, Peter addresses those in Jerusalem and preaches to them really and this is part of what he had to say he said ye men of Israel hear these words Jesus of Nazareth a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God.'" 
ye have taken and by, cruci- and, re- and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Come the day of Pentecost, Peter understood that all that befell Jesus Christ came about as a result of the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. It was necessary. And then in Acts chapter 3, in verses 17 and 18, uh, where he's addressing uh, those at the gate beautiful, he says, Now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, speaking of the uh, death of Christ, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But he goes on to say, But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Uh, Peter came to understand the necessity of the death of Jesus Christ. He came to be thankful for the death of Jesus Christ. I'll leave you with the words of Peter in 1 Peter 2, 23, 24. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again, speaking of Christ, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, whose own self bear our sins in his body, in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. That's what the cross was. The cross was the place of our healing. Amen. Let's stand for a a brief word of prayer. Uh, Well, we look at the life of Peter and we uh, look at Peter's words and we uh, think uh, how impetuous Peter was. But the truth is Peter is essentially no different from us. Sometimes we are so ignorant as to uh, the work that you are undertaking in our midst. And we think we know better. We think that the way that we uh, have conceived would be a preferable way. But Lord, what our prayer should be is that you should work out in our lives and the life of our nation and this world. All things are according to your will. Because the ultimate purpose that you are working towards is the actual salvation of your people, the salvation of your people in and through Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we should marvel at the uh, willingness of the Son of God to come into this world and to lay down his life in order that sinners such as we might be saved. Even as we say that, it seems uh, hardly believable that the uh, second person of the Trinity uh, should actually willingly lay down his life in order that uh, sinners such as we might be saved. So, Lord, uh, as we come to the Lord's Supper this morning, uh, may the uh, commitment and the willingness and the love of Jesus Christ uh, for his people stand out uh, before our eyes. These things we pray for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.